the whole concept of paramedic level care is to bring the advanced life-saving capabilities of the emergency room directly to the patient, wherever they may be. This saves time, which saves lives. But the pre-hospital environment is radically different than that of the hospital. So a machine that works perfectly well in here turns out to be too large, heavy, and fragile to carry into your living room or use in the side of the road. For the last 35 years, the Bellingham Fire Department, Wacom Medic 1, has been working with various high-tech manufacturers to adapt these machines for use out in the field. And today, we're going to have a look at a few of them. What's your name? Every call begins with an assessment of the basics, airway, breathing, and circulation. When a patient has stopped breathing or has a compromised airway, we may choose to insert an endotracheal tube past the vocal cords so we can breathe for them. A traditional endotracheal blade has a bright light near the tip. We use a combination of gentle neck movement and blade pressure to line up the paramedic's eye, the back of the throat, and the vocal cords before we can pass the tube. This process becomes more complicated when stomach contents are present, potential spinal fractures limit neck movement, the patient is in an awkward position, or crush injuries block the throat. A new device called the GlideScope minimizes these factors by placing a small video camera near the tip of the blade. The attached screen puts the paramedic's eyes right next to the vocal cords without moving the patient. The GlideScope is proving to be small, light, and rugged. In addition, our ongoing study is showing a significant reduction in the amount of time it takes to intubate a patient, which improves survival rates. But what about those times when the patient's breathing is compromised, but intubation may not be the best option? If the patient is still conscious, they will have a gag reflex, which blocks the tube. This can be overcome by the use of paralytic medications, but those do carry some risk. The continuous positive airway pressure machine allows us to assist conscious patients who need help without having to insert a tube. With this device, after the patient exhales, a small amount of residual pressure keeps the small spaces in the lungs from collapsing. This also helps congestive heart failure patients because it forces excess fluids from the lungs back into the bloodstream. And if additional medication is needed, then it can be introduced by a nebulizer that plugs into the tubing. And how do we know that these devices are helping the patient? That's where the pulse oximetry capnograph machine comes in. This clip has a light that passes through the finger or earlobe. The screen shows both the heart rate and how much oxygen is in the bloodstream. The device also measures how much carbon dioxide is exhaled. This indicates how well the heart and lungs are functioning. And how do we perform the field evaluations of these very expensive medical devices? Well, first comes the durability test. Okay, we really don't do that. Instead, what we do is fill out forms. Lots and lots of forms. And we talk to the engineers. The feedback that we give allows them to modify their devices into something that will actually work well for us out in the field. And in some cases, it's eventually led to Food and Drug Administration approval for their projects. So this time we've talked about airway and breathing devices. Next time we'll talk about circulation and a two-year study that we're doing for the National Institute of Health. <laughs>